السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام أهلا دكتورة حياك أهلا Welcome everyone to our panel uh, in which we will discuss the nature of research in HCI field. This panel is organized by CCIS agency for postgraduate studies and scientific research. Before we start, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Ronald Murshid, Assistant Professor at the Information Technology Department and Vice Dean Assistant for the College Vice Dean for Development and Quality. My research interest at the moment focused, focuses on HCI learning and software engineering, specifically how to facilitate for learning to code. Before we dive into this discussion, please allow me to introduce and welcome our panelists. We have Dr. Belsam Stier. She's an assistant professor uh, at the Department of Information Technology. She specializes in HCI research and interface design. She is interested in influencing human behavior through the design of computer systems. She has this, uh, conducted interdisciplinary research, connecting computer science to theories in psychology, child development, and education. We also have with us Dr. Tisam Abdel Qadir, an assistant professor at the Department of Information Technology. She's the founder and leader of the Arab HCI.org community and the vice chair of the ACM SIGKAI chapter for Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Tisam's, currently, uh, Dr. Uh, Tisam's current research focuses on HCI aspect of social computer interaction design and ML. We also have Dr. Sara Megan. She's an assistant professor at the software engineering. This, uh, your... Can you hear me? Yes. All clear. Okay. Yes. Um, I was introducing Dr. Sara Megan, uh, an assistant professor at the Software Engineering Department. Her research focuses on design, evaluation, and use of, uh, of techniques to improve the software development process. She is passionate about using HCI to design interactive software systems. Welcome, everyone. To kick off our discussion, I would like to start with what is HCI? HCI is a field of science that studies the design and use of computer technology, meaning how you should design, evaluate, and implement interactive computer systems with the goal of satisfying the user. So HCI mainly focuses on the human factor. That is why HCI has a broad scope, meaning that it draws upon interest and expertise in various disciplines, such as psychology, sociology, anthropology, cognitive science, computer science, and linguistics. Neglecting the role of human, the role that human play in operating in, in Operating the systems that computer scientists design can lead to disastrous outcomes. For example, to mention a few throughout the history, in 1984, there was the disaster of the Union Carbide India Limited Pesticide Plant in India that killed 3,800 uh, instantly and much more after the gas leak. The main, after investigation, the main cause of this disaster 
was uh, in relation to missing uh, equipment where it should be. This missing, or, or this is this situation of missing equipment resulted from the instructions of operating the system being written in English while the operators speak Hindi. So this inadequacy of considering the human factor resulted in uh, thousands killed. Another famous example is the Ch Chernobyl accident of the uh, power plant accident in 1986, also the, the which which resulted from the complexity of operating the power plant. There is also a third example of a disaster uh, that happened to the Aeroflot flight number 593 in 1994, which killed 75. The cause of this accident was because the, the, the autopilot disengaged without, uh, accidentally disengaged without the pilot knowing. Uh, the last example I'm giving you today was in 1999 that happened when uh, a, a fast train collided with another train, killing 31. The after investigation, the main cause was because the alarm, the alarm sound of a critical error or a, a critical. Uh, a critical situation was the same sound as the alarm for uh, a minor uh, situation, which led the conductor to acknowledge the alarm without actually um, uh, investigating or looking uh, investigating of the cause of this alarm. That being said, Excuse me, do you hear me? Uh, yes, واضح, Doctor. Okay. So after mentioning the catastrophe is related to an adequate HCI, I hope that the importance of HCI is established by now. The nature of doing research in HCI have a special flavor. A researcher can have or have to have an in-depth knowledge about the field. Another issue is that since it concerns human, an ethical approval also have to be acquired. To talk more about this, I would uh, like to invite our panelists to talk about their experience in uh, doing HCI research in different fields. Um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Tissan, who will talk to us about, uh, who will start by talking to us about her experience in doing HCI research in the healthcare um, field. Dr. Tisam. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rana, and welcome to everyone to the panel. So my PhD research was about designing a parent-driven coaching system for indirect speech therapy. To give you a bit of background about my research topic, the indirect or early speech and language therapy considered as an effective healthcare intervention to reduce the long-term symptoms of a speech and language delay. 
which is a common developmental delay uh, among preschool children below uh, five years old. And it can be associated with other developmental issues such as cerebral palsy or autism. Yet the responsibility of delivering these therapy techniques is rely, uh, relies mainly on uh, the parents as the direct interactor in the daily interaction with, uh, with their children. So uh, the therapist's role is to create, coach the parents or techniques to adapt uh, in their daily interaction with children and promote the child communication skill. But early speech and language therapy is challenged by the infrequent visit and lack of the needed support, which is affect the parents' engagement and adoption of these techniques. So my research focused on designing technology to support parent-therapist interaction, then analyzing the design qualities of an effective coaching techniques for parents. So I conducted a case study approach to observe the therapeutic coaching needs and issues across a number of uh, therapy protocol and with different disorders. So my approach involved two main studies. The first study is, uh, so both studies in collaboration with clinical partners. So the first study is, uh, the first study is called uh, ESOLT, which held in collaboration with National Health Services in UK for children with cerebral palsy. The second study um, was conducted in collaboration with the BACT clinical research team for young children with autism. Each of these studies uh, involved a multi-pronged approach in order to design the needed technology. So uh, the interdisciplinary nature of HCI research and in, in order to start these studies, I needed to establish the required knowledge in the field and got relevant training on different topics that are relevant to this specific domain. Starting from healthcare, I had to learn about the fundamental principle and techniques for early speech and language therapy, along with the different therapy service uh, delivery models. For example, in ESOLT, um, it was based on home visit and there were no video uh, involved in as part of the training technique delivered by the therapist or coaching technique delivered by the therapist. While for the back to program, it was more as a framework of stage protocol that utilized the video interaction guidance principles, which is a, a huge big topic that I needed to learn as well. This is in addition to learning the, ch the children developmental issues such as cerebral palsy uh, and autism in details and what's the health situation of these kind of disorders. Secondly, I had to, uh, to learn about the video interaction guidance principles and theory. Uh, so uh, it's a central principle actually in designing the solution in my research. So uh, the video, so to give you a bit of flavor about what the video interaction guidance principle, actually it's uh, where we use the video recording as a central element to reflect and analyze the recording interaction and to provide the needed guidance and feedback to improve these recorded interactions. So the video interaction guidance principle actually is a well-known coaching practice that's used in various domains such as in medical education and other fields to improve any interaction recorded where people look at their uh, recorded interaction and reflect on it. A third aspect that I had to explore and learn more about it is the psychology of parenthood and parenting children with special needs. So in order to learn about the difficulty they face as a parent in their daily interaction with their children, along with social challenges that facing them in their life, such as the stigma of having like a child with special needs in the community. These are important aspects actually for us as a designer to consider while designing the solution that can be useful and be adapted by these parents. And finally, I had to get a specific training and got specific courses from NHS uh, for inf related to information governance policies. So uh, to learn about more about the NHS structure and their own uh, policies and regulation, including the required uh, level of uh, data protection and encryption enforced by these institutes. Since these regulation actually uh, must be considered as part of any solution that designed to be adapted in these institutes as well as should be considered while me as a researcher doing the field work. Now moving to um, an, the multiple field studies 
as an HCI research being working with specific, specifically with vulnerable population in a study that involves series of design activities and deployment, we need to apply for ethical approval. So in my first study, and since I work directly with NHS, I had to get the ethical approval on the study from external research ethic committee and uh, from, uh, from NHS. Uh, so it's not part of the university. So also to work directly with the participant from NHS and after getting the ethical approval uh, and, um, and to get access to the clinical facilities and the participant homes, I need to, uh, to get the NHS research passport uh, which, uh, and provide the needed document uh, to get this passport, which is uh, like the DBS check verification or certificate to validate any criminal record of me as a researcher and to get the occupational health clearance certificate for to assure any to avoid any health issues also to conduct the research activities at participant home and to do some home visits i also had to submit and follow the guidance of the risk assessment provided by newcastle university to protect me as a researcher conducting this research while in the second case study and since i work directly with the clinical research team that had their own research cohort of parents of children with autism, there was no need to get an ethical approval from external uh, authority like an H NHS. So I had to get uh, the university ethical approval in this situation was enough. So the overall uh, ethical and recruitment pro process for my first case study, since it's relevant to NHS, took almost a whole year to, to complete. While compared to the second case study, it's a few months I got the approval uh, for this study. Now moving to the recruitment process, how it have been conducted in each of um, uh, in each of these studies. So uh, for the recruitment uh, through NHS, uh, it was extremely very, very slow since first I had to recruit the therapist to my study and the therapist worked as uh, a gatekeepers as we call them and via their clinical network, they recruited parents to join the study. While in the second case study, it was much, it was much easier and faster directly accessing parent therapists from the back research cohort. Also, it's important to note that working with such a vulnerable population faces the challenge of a dropout from the study at any stage, um, since it's usually up to 77% 77, uh, 7 of parents drop out of the, from the parent training therapy program and not committed to this program. And finally, as a closing note about my research and the impact of my research, uh, it's helped me to establish in-depth investigation from the domain. So uh, through the design process, it became apparent that there is some challenges that are not being met and we heard about new challenges as well. Also co-designing from the joint perspective from, with, from parents and therapists help to explore and understand the whole and big picture of the issues facing this kind of population and this, this, in this specific context. And interestingly, the reason that I titled my thesis as a parent-led therapy is the fact that I identified, identified the need to be thinking of technology in that way and posi positioning the parent um, more as a driving actor in terms of delivering the therapies rather than just the recipient of the coaching training, which consequently can improve the relational healthcare model between the health institute therapists and the, re the recipient of these therapy as a parent. And finally, um, the impact of my research had got like some significant impact on the power relation and the partnership with the clinical researcher. So co-designing and partnership with a clinical researcher indeed was challenged by the power relation between the various background, computing and health. So however, the design process helped to reduce these challenges by engaging the clinical researcher as a partner during the process where they start to value the, and trust the design process itself and help them to figure and helped us to figure a middle ground between the various stakeholders including parent therapist clinician and me as a de designer in this study and thank you thank you dr Tissam. so uh so what we understand here is that uh, doing a, a, a research in HCI involves uh, knowing in depth the interdisciplinary field you are bringing to the computer science and also have the difficulty of interacting with the uh, human subjects and acquiring the ethical approval of the organization to interact. Uh, 
uh, Dr. Sara, can you tell us about your experience and did you face the same uh, difficulties and challenges when you're doing your research? Sure, thank you so much, Dr. Rana. Uh, well, for me, it was a bit different when I was a PhD student. My dissertation was about value sensitive design of software to support collaboration in the workplace. And in order to support collaboration in the workplace, I had to understand the interplay between technology, people, and physical space. Uh, and in order to understand the interplay between these, I had to draw from theories of social psychology, organizational and physical aspects of group work, and also methods for the design of software, of course. I had to understand the context for which I'm designing for and its impact on the success of the collaborative software, especially because I was using a method uh, called value sensitive design, which is uh, focused mainly on uh, designing software by building in values. For example, in our region, uh, one of the biggest values is privacy. So considering how we can integrate privacy values within our software design. So I really had to understand the context for which I was designing for. And to, to do this, to design this collaborative workplace uh, software, I had to conduct a case study, an observation of the workplace. And I also conducted some interviews with the employees and had several participatory design sessions. But before I could do all of this, I had to get ethical approval. Alhamdulillah, I didn't have to go through as many hoops as Dr. Ibtisam had to go through. Um, it was actually rather simple for me for IRB approval. I just had to submit my plan to the university that I was studying at. Uh, and upon review, they decided that I was actually exempt from IRB review. So uh, rather than going through the process of IRB review, they told me early on, you don't need IRB review because of the nature of your research, because you're not dealing with a sensitive group and you're not dealing with a sensitive topic. So I had, uh, in fact, been exempt from IRB review. And uh, Dr. Sara, can you, can you elaborate more on what do you mean by not dealing with sensitive group and not dealing with sensitive data for our sure. listeners to, uh, dis yeah, to differentiate between your case and Dr. Tissam's case? Sure. So as in Dr. Ibtisam's group uh, case, she was dealing with uh, the health place or, or the healthcare context, uh, which is a sensitive topic. And we're dealing with private information. And she's also dealing with a sensitive group of people. Um, an example of a sensitive group of people are uh, children or uh, people with disabilities or uh, people who, who, who you're going to be using to gain information. This is a sensitive group of people because they're going to be sharing sensitive information with you. Uh, for me personally, I was, I was uh, actually uh, needing uh, information about the workplace, the workplace practices, how work is usually done, how collaboration is usually done to achieve specific tasks. So I wasn't dealing with any sensitive information and the group of people who I was going to be observing and interviewing were adults and they were not a sensitive group. Um, so that's why, uh, for me personally, I was exempt from IRB review because I wasn't dealing with a sensitive group or a sensitive topic. You'll see also uh, in the next panelist, Dr. Belsam, is going to be talking about another sensitive group, children, uh, in the educational context, which is a sensitive uh, space. Anytime you're dealing with children, you have to go through a lot of hoops to uh, get ethical approval. But for me personally, I was exempt from ethical approval. Thank uh, you for clarifying. Sure, and uh, the exemption wasn't just a person telling me you don't have to go through this. I did have to go through uh, the process, but I was told early on that my, uh, my uh, uh, submission was exempt, meaning that I did not have to go through the elaborated uh, process. I just had to, they just had to know the nature of my work and they told me that I was exempt at the time. Sure. And uh, regarding your recruitment, was sure. it different? It was, it was a bit different because I had to find a workplace to conduct the case study on. Uh, and to find the workplace, I had to consider first the inclusion criteria. For me personally, I needed a medium sized organization that operates within Riyadh. Uh, to find the organization, I reached out so, to some of my contacts and shared, uh, you know, documentation showing that I was legitimate. Uh, a letter from my advisor, 
a letter from my university, the purpose of my research and so, and so on. And through my contacts, I was able to get an organization to agree uh, to participate in the case study. Uh, after this, I started, of course, the observational sessions and uh, the interviews and participatory design sessions and so on. So for me, it was, it was, of course, it's time consuming. Anytime you're doing a field study, it takes months to actually gather your data. But uh, I did not have to go through as many hoops as Dr. Abtisam, of course. Uh, and the result of my research, alhamdulillah, was great. Through my work, I utilized value-sensitive design to uh, integrate values within the design of the software. But I also extended the value-sensitive design framework by investigating how social, uh, socio-spatial configuration, meaning the social and the physical aspects of the workplace, can also support or hinder the uh, technology, uh, technology's effectiveness. Um, and finally, I provided some design implications or insight on how to design uh, computer-supported cooperative work technologies to support values in the workplace. And specifically, I focused on privacy values as to enhance collaboration within the workplace. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Belson worked on another uh, sensitive group, uh, which was uh, children in education. Uh, Dr. Belson, can you join us and, and, and tell us more about your experience? Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rana. I, um, I completed my master's and my PhD in HCI um, at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Uh, my PhD was uh, titled Designing to Motivate Interaction Between Peers in Learning Contexts. Um, to briefly summarize my work, I uh, designed a mobile system that allows school children to provide and request support from each other. So I worked in the field of education and designing technology to support education. Um, and um, as a consequence, I had to delve quite deeply into theories of learning and child develop development, um, as well as theories in psychology. Um, I specifically looked at um, what drives humans uh, to certain behaviors and how to influence that drive. For example, what motivates people to perform tasks and how to influence and support that, uh, that motivation. Um, I then translated that, um, uh, that information and that um, uh, knowledge in psychology of motivation um, into, um, uh, uh, into the design um, uh, of my system. So I translated the affecting factors and the factors that affect and influence people um, into um, uh, uh, an electronic system. Um, through this approach, I was able to build a system that allows students to seek support from each other. Um, I uh, found that students who were usually uninterested in learning and uh, disengaged from learning um, were actually those students that used the system the most and that those that had uh, statistically significant improvement in their motivation to learn from others. Um, and since I had to work with people, I of course had to apply for ethical approval for my research. Um, this involved explaining my work, how I intended to involve um, people and why was my work important. Um, and especially since I was working with children, the, uh, the UK um, rules and regulation required me to get a CRB check, uh, which is a background security check just to make sure I was okay to interact with children. Um, this process took about a month for me. It wasn't that difficult. Um, however, um, as typical in um, HCI research, I had multiple field studies, both long-term, short-term, large-scale and small-scale. Um, and um, I had to do those to be able to answer my research questions. Um, so I had to recruit a large number of participants. Um, the recruitment itself was not easy. I had to go through gatekeepers, um, through schools and, and um, head teachers to be able to recruit um, uh, students. Um, and I found that getting people involved and keeping them involved in, in, in research uh, requires a lot of effort from the researcher's side. Um, I needed to constantly monitor uh, their progress their, and I needed to communicate with them um, on a regular basis to make sure they are still on board and still um, uh, interacting. 
Um, and it is this involvement of, of humans in HCI research makes the research especially uh, vulnerable. Um, any changes in the environment um, or in, in, in the situation will directly impact the involvement of the participant. Um, and as a result of that, it will impact the work. Um, unfortunately, this happened to me um, a few weeks into uh, one of my three month long large scale studies. Um, the UK Secretary of Education um, announced uh, changes on um, the curriculum for schools and it had to take place immediately. Um, as a result of that change in the environment, um, I, um, my, my research obviously took backseat importance uh, for the schools I was working with. Um, and consequently, I brought, lost around 150 participants almost overnight. Um, that was um, a, a huge blow to me um, as a researcher and to my work. But um, I think uh, part of what we learn as HCI researchers is the ability to adapt and uh, change uh, focus sometimes and sometimes just tweaking um, your research methodology um, to adapt or to, to be um, doable within the situation you're in. Um, so I just adjusted my plans, I moved on. Um, and um, I just got along with it. Um, although this is probably a little bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe a negative aspect you might see, um, but on the flip side, when HCI research works out and when your plans for study work, uh, studies work out, um, it is this human involvement that makes the research vulnerable. It is also um, the things that makes this res the research very rewarding to the researcher. You as a researcher see firsthand the impact of your work on humans. So in my work, um, I was able to successfully translate psychology of motivation into design, which was never done before. Um, I was able to, to witness firsthand the impact on um, humans. So I was um, able through the design of my system to motivate um, uh, students that are usually demotivated and detached and disengaged from learning. And I was able to get them more engaged academically. I was able to um, break the barriers they had um, as students. Um, they had built against their peers and against interacting with their peers in academic settings. Um, so I think um, 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 HCI research can be very um, fulfilling in that uh, perspective. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Balsam. So uh, on that note, on the note of uh, doing research and, and acquiring ethical approval, uh, I know that you have done uh, such uh, studies here in uh, KSU. So do you have any tips and tricks to get the KSU ethical approval? Yes, of course. So uh, what I found uh, with uh, Case Youth's ethical approval, it is evolving. Um, um, it is growing as, as uh, uh, an entity in the university. So they are constantly adapting and changing things. So uh, applying for ethical approval a couple of years ago uh, was quite different than it was uh, last year when I applied last. Um, the committee's website, unfortunately, is only in Arabic. The committee's name is Lejnat Akhlaqiyat al Bath al-Ilmi. Uh, they have three subcommittees under them. So one uh, subcommittee is uh, the committee that deals with research on humans, another one that deals with research on animals and plants, and a third one that deals with research um, in the area of humanities and social, uh, societal uh, research. Um, so the first step would be to, to um, align your research with one of these subcommittees because you will be submitting to a subcommittee. Um, in the case of HCI research and the research I've worked with, um, we submitted to the subcommittee uh, concerning um, research on humans. Um, the applications themselves have um, several categories. So there is a broad um, category of medical research applications. Um, there is scientific research um, applications, animal research, plant research, and humanities research. Um, I found that my work roughly uh, translated um, in the scientific research application. However, I had to, we had to fill um, uh, some uh, forms from uh, the uh, clinical trials application, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but it makes sense when you look at the, the uh, application itself. Um, the website is um, shown here on the slide. Um, it is very informative, unlike it was before. It, before it was a little bit, um, um, not really covering or comprehensive covering everything 
Um, now it is very comprehensive. There's a checklist you can check. There is a list of instructions you need to follow. Um, each um, application type or category of application has its own group of um, forms that are uh, mandatory, then a group of optional forms, depending on the nature of your um, research. Um, if, um, so what do you need to prepare to be able before you apply for um, ethical approval? You need um, the CVs of all of the researchers involved. Um, you need an abstract for the study, uh, background, objectives, methods. You need to clearly state what the contribution to knowledge is. Um, you also need um, a detailed proposal that has the objectives, uh, 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 an extended sort of extended literature review, uh, the methodology in detail. Um, you also need um, all of the consent forms that you will be using. Um, there's, as I said, a checklist that goes through the steps of what you need to um, uh, supply or uh, provide. Um, the um, forms, all of the forms available uh, have both English and Arabic versions. Um, a, a couple of years ago, we were required to fill both Arabic and English, but I think uh, that this time around when I applied last year, um, we were only required to fill one. So we filled English, um, um, the English forms. Um, once ready uh, to submit, uh, you, you need to uh, submit all of the relevant or all of the needed forms to the committee you've chosen through email, um, which was in my case, the research on humans. Um, some of the tips uh, that I learned in doing this process a couple of times was to plan early. Um, I was fortunate in, in both of my research um, projects that I worked on, uh, we have the summer vacation to apply. Um, you need to plan early. They usually provide you with um, the date of the committee's meetings and the deadlines for those uh, meetings so you can um, uh, make sure that your application gets seen on a specific meeting. They give you when the deadline is for submitting. Um, uh, going through the process, they, they do have um, a secretary that looks at things and sometimes returns forms back to you, back to, you to um, elaborate. So if you want to go through it uh, first time around, um, provide as much details as possible, especially um, in the methodology aspect and the methodology section. They like to know exactly what data are you gathering, how are you gathering it, where are you going to store it, how are you going to deal with it, um, is it anonymous, um, are you going to have uh, personal information and that sort of thing. I also found that um, uh, you shouldn't sit and wait for the result or the committee's um, uh, decision to um, uh, be provided or sent to you, you need to follow up. Follow up via email, via their phone numbers. They've provided everything on their website, which is quite um, comprehensive, as I said. Thank you, Dr. Balsam. Uh, moving to a different topic, and I would like to direct this uh, question for uh, Dr. Tissam uh, al Qadir. Uh, if you can uh, talk to us uh, about HCI for uh, the Arabic culture, given your position in the uh, HCI for Arab. Thanks, Dr. Rana. So here I'll discuss the Arab, uh, how Arab researcher highlighted the importance to establish a unique characteristics of the Arab communities that distinguish Arab from Western user and design digital technology that cater for them. So uh, to discuss the effort of Arab and non-Arab researcher and highlight some of the consideration related to the Arab context, uh, and the distinctive Arab HCI research. Starting from the design value and consideration, there are a few examples that, that touch the surface of the depth and richness of the Arab culture which affect the system design. So international researchers when adapting their system to Arabic, for example, have often simply translate the interfaces while this is useful, it actually doesn't provide the needed quality user experience. For example, designing a social network website, the word friend has like almost 26 different translation in Arabic, choosing which translation in specific, in specific context influence the design acceptance. Also, uh, most Arab are very touched with their religion, universal design, do not accommodate for that. But as we know, religion is a significant driver for Arab Muslim behavior as it appeared in how they integrated in their online practices. For instance, if we are looking at Twitter, for example, the Holy Quran tweets, which is in, uh, uh, interpreted as an act of worship since social media account could extend beyond their lifetime. So people post the, uh, the Holy Quran tweets uh, and consider it as a good place to share a good deeds after 
their lifetime. So another significant marker of Arab culture is the gender differences. So while this is, might be well known, the details on how this influence the technology use is not incorporated in the system design process. For instance, the fact that Arab women are concerned with their reputation and have a greater requirement of privacy protection of their personal data. So uh, another distinctive aspect of Arab HCI research is using a unique design method with Arab users. So researchers encounter several challenges when implementing Western originated methodologies in the Arab context. Another challenge faced by some of the re Arab uh, Saudi researchers in specific is the difficulty encountered during conducting in-home interview due to the busy nature of Saudi homes and a large number of people at home. So to overcome these challenges, they introduce specific cultural prop designed to assist them with this unique population and unique Arab problem. Uh, another aspect in the Arab HCI research um, uh, is the participant recruitment. So uh, participant recruitment is normally a challenge, uh, is, is a big challenge for any researcher. So uh, the participant recruitment in the Arab world had like an added complexity, especially when recruiting female participants. For instance, Saud Nasser, if you know him, actually discussed this extensively, noting that uh, in a community with the conservative Saudi society, the male guardian of female participants may, may not approve of their communication, even with female researchers. So this is one of the big challenges while recruiting participants locally here in Saudi Arabia. So these are some few examples of the value and challenges that have been reported across multiple studies which highlight the unique cultural value in the Arab world and need to be considered and resolved in the design process for any uh, within any uh, HCI research. So if I can discuss the HCI communities and Arab researcher representation, the premier HCI community for um, uh, for, for HCI is actually ACM Sekai, which is the world's largest association of professional working on research and practice of computer human interaction. So, and the first, um, uh, the top first ranked conference in the field is Kai Conference, where uh, Sekai Executive Committee meets annually along with all HCI professional and students there. So many researchers, uh, specifically Arab researchers, found there is a lack of representation of Arab researchers and local studies at CHI and SIGCHI com uh, committee as well. Yet there is a huge interest from a limited number of Arab researchers participating in these conferences to get like connected with each other and help to advance the field, the HCI field in the Arab world. So in 2016, Arab HCI community uh, was established with the goal to empower and connect these HCI researchers from, uh, from the Arab world, as well as bridging with the international ACM Sekai community. So one of the community goal is to leverage our own insider understanding of HCI research in, within an Arab context and explore the challenges and unique opportunities for future research. Thank you, Dr. Arana. Thank you, Dr. Azara. And now, uh, since we are almost out of time, I would like to end with uh, inviting Dr. Azara with, to introduce us to introduce us to the trends in HCI research. Sure. As HCI researchers, we're constantly thinking about what's next, what's next for our research, and there's always more to do. Um, from designing new interfaces to integrating new techniques to support human activities or improving processes of technology development in general. And what's interesting is the recent developments in technology have made a lot of positive impacts on uh, the human computer interaction research community. Let's take a look at some examples. First is uh, interaction with computers. Interaction with computers has changed so much over time where we used to interact with computers through a keyboard or a mouse, now we interact with computers through touch screen, using voice commands or eye movements, hand gestures, and even brain waves. This leaves so much space for more research in this area and interacting with computers. In addition, we not only have computers and mobile phones, now we're actually needing to deal with the usability of wearables, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and so on. All of these require additional investigation. And we don't have any usability heuristics for these. We don't have any accessibility guidelines for these. All of them are rather new. 
In addition, we're constantly integrating techniques to improve the user experience. For example, through artificial intelligence or data science in general. There's so much left to do. There's so much left to explore. Uh, for me personally, I've been working on um, improving the software development process. For example, my current project is on designing an automated accessibility checker because uh, unfortunately until this day, software engineers don't focus much on accessibility because it's time consuming and they don't have enough experience in it and it's not a priority for them. So automating the accessibility checking uh, will help, will hopefully encourage them to check for accessibility. Another project that I'm working on is incorporating new techniques like artificial intelligence to automate the maintenance phase of the software development. And I'm also working on uh, a project uh, that's uh, in the area of uh, designing uh, software to support uh, specific user bases, like designing software to, to support uh, people with disabilities, uh, designing using uh, methods of software de development that's rather new, like co-design to build assistive technology. Perhaps some of our panelists can also share some of the topics they're working on. Uh, Dr. Belsen. Um, yes, I think uh, I'll, I'll just touch on my work a little bit uh, briefly, just so that um, we don't run on, on time and we have some, maybe some more time for questions. Um, do I have time now, Dr. Arana? Just a couple of minutes. Uh, one minute. Okay. So I uh, I'll talk about one uh, project that's concluded. Um, I did a project. I worked on a project with one of my master's students that involved um, designing a game for speech delay children to be used with speech therapists. Um, the game was um, designed as a 3D environment and took into consideration the psychology of motivation, um, which is a, a a special passion of mine, um, motivating people through design. Um, when the game was used by the children and the therapists, we actually found that it increased the children's motivation for speech therapy sessions. Usually children um, get bored during those sessions with the normal tedious sort of um, activities they do. Um, the children were more engaged. They measured higher motivation than they had before using the system. Uh, we also found that the progress in therapy was uh, better when using the game compared when, to when using traditional methods of speech therapy. Um, I can conclude with that. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balsam. Thank you, Dr. Azara, for sharing that with us. And uh, lastly, uh, I hope we intrigued our audience uh, to uh, intrigue their interest in HCI. And uh, these are a couple of uh, places we, I want to end up with where you can uh, look in, uh, for um, new ideas and what, what the HCI uh, community is all about. Um, now, I would like also to mention a few uh, computer human interaction, which is the famous Sky conference, uh, computer supported cooperative work and social computing, uh, preserve, uh, preserve, uh, pervasive and ubiqu ubiquitous computing and uh, international journal for human computer uh, study. Uh, thank you all uh, for listening. Uh, now we open it for questions, if there is any. Um, so, hello? Yes, hi. Uh, this is uh, Nofil Alola. I'm a PhD student in uh, KSU currently. Uh, my master's was in HCI, uh, but it was uh, a while ago, actually more than 10 years ago. So um, my question is to the panelists. Uh, when I came back 2010 with a master in HCI, my research was in uh, CSCW collocated coordination. Uh, I struggled in explaining the importance of my work uh, in the community here. Uh, it seems like it, um, there was, um, um, well, I wanna put it in words. Um, it, HCI work was not as um, 
withheld as other kind of hardcore programming, uh, parallel programming, whatever, that, that kind of work. So my question to the panelist is, then I got, for a while I got, um, I lost touch with the research world here. Uh, so how, is that struggle still um, a thing? That's one since I'm just starting my PhD, that's my first question. My second question is, um, do, do I, I mean, I, I listened very carefully to especially Dr. Sara's uh, um, uh, talking about the, the challenges of HCI work with the, and, the, and the fragileness of HCI work, but uh, do you think in any way it compromises the output or the scientific output of it? And how do you uh, present that to, uh, uh, I mean, the research world here in computer science in general? Thank you. Thank you, Nof. Uh Dr. Sara, it seems that the, uh, the second, the question is uh, kind of directed to you, mm -hmm. so. Yes, I, I completely understand the struggle. I think all of everyone involved in HCI understands this struggle uh, being taken ser seriously in the computer science world. And it's it's gotten better. I can de I can definitely tell you since 2010, a lot has changed. Um, and uh, the way that we show the importance of our work is, of course, to show the impact of it through our uh, research results and also to show how integrated it is with the computer science discipline. For me personally, what I've been doing to, um, to highlight the significance of my work is to show how much contribution it can make to the software development life cycle. For, for someone who's working in uh, the software uh, department, this is how I make a contribution to my department and to the software engineering community use HCI for software development uh, processes to improve the software development processes. Any other comments from the panelists? I think we all agree on, on the stigma of uh, doing research on HCI. And uh, I would like to second what Dr. Sara said that uh, showing the impact is is um, is something that will help advance your research, and also uh, it's not only the immediate impact. Show, showing the uh, future impact and uh, on on the uh, human well being and and uh, the community uh, well being as a whole will help at that too. Um. Thank you very much. The thing is sometimes the, the impact is or the contribution is incremental. Uh, social science, sciences are, are um, it's complicated. It's soft science versus hard science. Uh, it's not like we you and run your tests and show your results. Uh, it does need defending, it's a debate. It could be called as a debate. So um, that is the, since, I mean, my work was how different methods of uh, technical methods of supporting uh, coordination in a co-located working environment, um, change the flow of work and et cetera. So um, it is incremental. I cannot point to one very uh, distinct, distinct or very huge uh, impact on the computing world or the computer science world. But I do believe that it's, it's important. So, yes. Thank you, Nof. Uh, thank you, Nof. Uh, any more questions from our audience? يعطيك العافية دكتورة رنا يعطيكم عافية جميعا زميلات العزيزات فيها few questions on the chat the first one is what is the current and future state of HCI in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia for both academic and the market وكمان so we'll start with this question and then we can move to the other one
you want me to repeat uh, the question? Yes. Or is it clear? Yes. Can you repeat okay. the question? Sure. So it's um, it's about the current and future state of HCI in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, both in uh, the academic world and in the markets. Um, the, since Dr. Balsam and Dr. Sarah are the one who did some uh, studies in, in uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, would you like to answer that? Um, I think in terms of, of uh, research, just like uh, Dr. Abtisam covered, um, there is a lack of, of uh, socially or, or um, uh, relevant um, research relevant to our culture, to our Arabic culture. Um, I, I can see that, I saw that, um, we touched upon it a little bit in my research with um, children regarding speech therapy. We did find um, some differences and some requirements for their, uh, for the virtual environment um, and, and how they wanted their, their game to appear like. Um, as for the market, I think it is quite clear now um, that uh, we're, we're doing huge leaps um, in our country uh, towards um, digital um, uh, uh, spaces. Um, as you can see, the government, digital government websites, the applications, um, and all of that. HCI has a direct impact on um, whether or not a certain application will be used properly, whether or not it will be popular among um, users or not. Um, for example, I think um, a, a a great example would be um, Absher's application. As you can see now, it's evolving and it's getting more and more, um, um, it's getting easier to use because of um, HCI practices being adopted um, into its design. Um, Tawakkalna is another um, prime example of very um, good HCI um, um, or user interface design. Um, so market-wise, I think there is an awareness of a need to design things properly and in a way that attracts users and makes them do their work in the most efficient and easiest way possible. Fikaman, one more question about the difference between UX and HCI. Uh, does anybody, uh, other panelists want to discuss this? If I may go, Dr. Arana, and, and uh, answer this question, if it's okay with you. Okay, so um, UX is a part of, of HCI. It's a... Um, it's a new... Um, sort of new new name of an area that's already been there all along. Um, I think this is a trend in HCI generally. Um, things tend to be renamed after a while, given a, a, a catchier, uh, buzzworthy name, um, and um, then reintroduced with a little bit, some more tweaks or some more involvement. Um, UX is part of HCI, there is no difference. HCI, you can look at HCI as an umbrella, that uh, encompasses um, UX design within it. Yeah, yeah, take a laugh Dr. Abelsam. I think uh, we're, we're, we're missing Dr. Arana, uh, but uh, okay, so we have it. We have her back. Ahlan Dr. Arana. Uh, Dr. Arana, can you hear us? Yes, Ahlan. Adran, Ahlan. Okay. I'll technical difficulty it happen. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Uh, so we, Dr. Abelsam answered the question about the difference between UX and HCI, and uh, I don't think we have any more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, panel and joining us. Uh, if you have more questions, um, me and the panelists are uh, more than happy to answer it uh, via email. Uh, thank you again. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.